uh, going from DEI issues to uh, patient initiated verbal sexual assault. Uh, Ashley Polsky is going to talk to us about that. Dr. Polsky. Thanks, Dr. Hoffman. And thank you. That was an incredible talk. Thank you so much for that. Let's see if I can. There we go. Um, so I'm going to be giving a surgical and clinical staff update on um, this workshop that we've brought to the Moran Eye Center. And uh, here's a review, or sorry, and this is just a little summary of what we'll go over today. Um, so I'll review our findings from last year's workshop on responding to patient-initiated initiated sexual harassment. Um, some of you probably remember this project from last year's Resident Research Day. Um, I'll then discuss updates from our more recent workshops, which I held for our surgical and clinical staff this year, and then we'll briefly go over some future goals for this project. So last year, we implemented a workshop for Moran attendings and trainees based on a really awesome program developed by Aaron Schreiber and the, the University of Iowa Department of Ophthalmology. The workshop utilizes interactive discussion and role play scenarios to highlight uh, various strategies for responding to patient-initiated verbal harassment, which is actually the most common form of harassment in medicine. And participants then retrospectively completed a survey that assessed their pre- and post-workshop preparedness to respond to patient-initiated harassment. The survey consists of two pages that allow participants to subjectively rank their pre- and post-workshop preparedness for responding to harassment and to provide any workshop feedback if they have any. Um, and a third page then focuses on participant demographics and their own prior experiences with patient-initiated harassment. So just to review, last year we found that while a majority of participants had both experienced and witnessed patient-initiated harassment in the workplace, less than a quarter of participants had actually received formal training to handle harassment from patients. We also found that participants reported significant improvements in their ability to recognize forms of harassment, to discuss the prevalence and impact of this harassment, and to respond to harassment um, toward themselves or their coworkers after the workshop. So one of our major goals last year was to then expand this workshop to other groups at the Moran Eye Center, including our surgical and clinical staff. And while there's pretty limited research regarding the prevalence of patient-initiated sexual harassment for ophthalmic technicians and scrub techs in ophthalmology, multiple previous studies have shown that verbal sexual harassment is a really common issue in nursing and that the most frequent source of this harassment is from patients. Um, so we were really motivated to see how this issue has impacted our own Moran employees and hopefully to provide some useful strategies for responding to harassment in surgical and clinical settings through this workshop. I'll first discuss our findings from the workshop that we held for our surgical staff, which included um, our PACU nurses, scrub techs, and surgery front desk team. Uh, so a total of 29 employees participated in this workshop with about 80% females and 20% males. And prior to the workshop, about 80% of all participants had experienced patient-initiated sexual harassment, and over 40% had witnessed harassment of a colleague or a trainee in the workplace. However, only 20% had actually received formal training to handle harassment from patients. Based on ratings on a five-point Likert scale, we found that after the workshop, um, our surgical staff reported significant improvements in their ability to recognize forms of patient-initiated sexual harassment and to discuss the prevalence and impact of this harassment at, in their work. Um, and they also reported significant improvements in their preparedness to respond to so sexual harassment, not only toward themselves, but toward coworkers after the workshop. 
We then held the workshop for our clinical staff, including our ophthalmic technicians and our schedulers. And in this workshop, we had a total of 33 participants with about 70% females and 30% males. And in this case, nearly 85% of participants reported previously experiencing patient-initiated sexual harassment. And I'll just mention that when we look specifically at females, this number comes to 100% essentially every time. Um, also, a majority had witnessed harassment of a coworker, but less than half of these participants had ever received formal training for dealing with patient-initiated harassment. And similarly, we found that our clinical staff reported significant improvements in their ability to recognize forms of harassment, to discuss the prevalence and impact of this harassment, and to respond to harassment toward themselves or their coworkers after the workshop. And before I come to a close, I, I wanted to also share with you a few actual comments from participants in the workshops this year. Um, I think that one of the real benefits of expanding this workshop to our surgical and clinical staff is that it really allowed us to get a better sense for how this issue impacts our employees here at Moran, because unfortunately, many of these negative patient interactions happen behind the scenes and not necessarily in front of the resident or in front of the attending. And so this was just a really good opportunity for us to become more aware of what our techs and our nurses are going through. So I'm just gonna read these comments and feedback aloud. Thanks for addressing this. Harassment from patients always seemed like something we just have to put up with. The workshop was really good and appreciated. I've had many experiences with harassment and not known how to respond before this. Loved this training, very needed and should be done yearly. Sexual harassment from patients happens daily in the clinic. That one really hit me. Um, and just having the workshop shows support for staff and opens the door to confronting the issue. So in summary, one of the major points I wanna highlight is that verbal sexual harassment from patients is unfortunately a very prevalent issue that impacts the majority of our colleagues and staff, um, especially our female coworkers. And these workshops have shown that interactive discussion and rehearsal of communication techniques through role play can be really helpful for improving our preparedness to respond to this harassment. And as some of our participant comments mentioned, holding workshops like this can be a really useful way to promote more open dialogue about this topic and hopefully to empower our staff to more effectively respond to harassment when it does occur. In the future, we're interested in writing up and publishing our findings from the last two years, given that there's currently a gap in literature regarding the impact of patient-initiated harassment on techs and nurses in ophthalmology. And based on the feedback we've received so far, I, I think that this could be a useful workshop to repeat every few years, um, especially for incoming trainees, such as new residents, new clinic and surgical hires. And then multiple participants have also expressed interest in having the workshop specifically address racial or sexual orientation-based harassment, which is also a big problem. Um, and so that's something that potentially um, in future workshops, we could certainly incorporate and uh, highlight more. So here's some relevant references. And these are the people I have to thank. Um, Dr. Katz was the one who originally came to me with the idea of doing this workshop. And he came to every single one of the workshops that I held. So I, I really appreciate the support there. Um, Dr. Long helped present this workshop with me last year for, for one of the workshops that we held. And then Dr. Jacoby was really supportive of this project too. Um, so thank you to all three. And then if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. We have a little question okay. at the end of the session, just to lay some ground rules. And we're going to move ahead with our next talk. That was wonderful. Absolutely. Next, next, we're going to hear from Brandon Kennedy, Tony Mai, Lydia Sauer, and they're going to talk to us about renovating the intern year. Afternoon, everyone. This is a combination talk between the three of us. This project we've been working on for a while, and we're going to have some updates here. We're just going to jump in. Um, so 
this is about now three years follow up and then just looking forward into the future what is coming up next so we're going to do a quick timeline review that's what i'm going to be doing so things really started in 2021 when there was a memorandum saying that every ophthalmology program needs to have an integrated intern year with three months in the intern year moran has been doing this for a long time but some programs haven't so this became something that was standard and we felt this was an opportunity to take a critical look at what we've been doing and how we can make it better and so we looked at our intern year at that time and uh, some data that we got then showed that about 70 to 60 or 60 to 70 percent was spent doing administrative work um, doing things that were not necessarily clinical and so we asked ourselves what can we do to make that better uh, and so that brought us to this quality improvement project where we uh, worked with many of uh, like the um uh, academic team like Dr. Simpson, Dr. Petty, and so on. And we wanted to see what we can do to change the intern year specifically. So um, going off of uh, comments of other feedback, we decided to split up our intern year who was uh, that was initially all the VA into things at the Moran also, including triage and our consults rotation. Many of the uh, interns saying that there was a rough transition into PGY two year because of calls. So how can we prepare them better for this? So sorry, pardon the, um, the formatting issues here. There was just some issues with transferring the PowerPoint, but basically we had six weeks in triage uh, integrated and then the next six weeks was in consults. Uh, and then we also changed some things in the clinic, like instead of having the interns do all the H&Ps, do all the consents. Now, most of the residents who personally sign the patients up do those themselves. Uh, and then a lot of the more academic, uh, not academic, sorry, a lot of the more um, administrative stuff, thank you, um, that we did previously with scheduling is now delegated to a specific scheduler who handles all of that too. Um, we also added like a boot camp to help transition them into the PGY two year. So this is a survey that we did. And we also looked at some time spent on uh, kind of work in the clinic and it showed that there was a big flip. Now about 70 to 80% is in clinical instead of the administrative work before. Uh, so that was a big success. And then we went from 2022 to 2023, um, asking the residents, what are changes that we can do? How can we improve the time spent spent at Moran and uh, looking at some surveys, they really felt that the time on consults compared to triage was a lot more effective, taught them a lot more, just seeing pathology diverse in the hospital. And so we changed the current schedule to reflect that by now, putting them all in consults instead and taking them out of triage. Uh, we also added an extra boot camp in the beginning of the year, knowing that residents come from many different uh, backgrounds, different uh, um, just abilities to do the clinical exam. And so we did this so that everyone can have a same starting point right as they started out in the beginning of the year. Um, so now going from 23 to 24, uh, we are now looking back and asking what are things we can improve on. And the questions that we're asking is, as Tony mentioned, are these uh, changes effective and are there any issues that need to be addressed further? So we send out another, uh, another survey to gather some feedback. And the first graph on the left-hand side here uh, uh, shows the time spent on clinical tasks. Clinical tasks include seeing patients, also writing the notes, doing phone calls, triaging, but anything that has to do with patient care. And you can see that the, PGI, the current PGI force felt like this was about 20 to 40 percent of their time. Uh, one answered 40 to 60 percent of the time it still was somewhat similar in the current PGY3 class, but then starting the PGY2 and PGY1 class, it is reflected that uh, the time spent on clinical tasks was almost uh, 80 to 100 percent, whereas time spent on administrative tasks reflected in the other graph was very high uh, for the current PGY force, up to 60 to 80 percent of the time. And this included really scheduling, printing, uh, making sure that chief packets were done and other various administrative tasks that we were able to offload um, in, in the process of all of this. And we also asked the question, how well did you prepare for taking call by the end of intern year, which uniformly 
But residents felt pretty well prepared, but how well were they actually prepared when they started taking call? And I think that the it shows very nicely that the PGRI 4 class, it was one exception, did not feel well prepared when they actually were on the spot taking call. But as the years move on, that additional training in intern year really has helped with uh, starting to take call as a PGRI 2. And we also asked the current residents how valuable was the consultation? And I didn't make a graph because everybody said that being on consults was extremely valuable and the time in the VA clinics was also extremely valuable. However, um, when we kind of tried to split it up a little bit on what changes we would recommend doing, a lot of the more senior residents felt that um, interns, keeping the interns at the VA, but perhaps uh, suggesting for them to see patients there a little bit more might be helpful for the intern, but also be helpful for the clinic flow overall. I'm just going to go back real quick. So I just heard a question. I just wanted to answer real quick. So the, the first graph about clinical administrative tasks. So this is like the current PGY4s, but our reflection during intern year, right? It's like, we're not thinking we're doing 80% administrative work right now. <laughs> That'd be horrible. <laughs> um, awesome. So then we just had kind of an open blank blanket statement of what has been the most helpful thing during intern year to all residents um, and resident feedback. Oh, it looks like there is a slide missing here. That's okay. So we also asked about resident feedback and um, this, these are direct quotes from residents. So the ability to have seniors around to double check, help out and answer questions interacting with the upperclassmen um, and having them share their knowledge. I love having time to learn during the VA clinic for call, holding the pager and acting as though it was me on call. Seeing patients in the VA walk-in clinic was extremely valuable. Consults, one-on-one -on -one teaching. So a lot of this kind of revolves around getting that one-on-one -on -one time with either another resident, fellow, or attending and having those um, good teaching interactions. What can be improved for a better intern year? Having an automated way of having surgical packets, so it's still one administrative task that the interns do, although it's significantly decreased the prior to the changes, they're still doing these surgical packets. Friday night buddy call could likely be done away with since we have Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday time on consults as well as call. And then a graduated approach to the intern months, maybe some more guidance. The first month, never carry the pager. Second month, carry the pager a little bit more. Third month, carry the pager even a little bit more than that and a little bit more structure in regards to teaching on exams. So moving towards our conclusions and our outlooks, this is our last slide here. So overall, um, the amount of administrative work has really decreased over the past couple of years, and our initial goal was achieved, but now we're looking forward to how we can still make things better. Um, the residents overall don't just feel better prepared for call, but they actually are better prepared for call. Teaching and supervising has been implemented in a very meaningful way, and residents learn the system on call in a very well and structured manner from their senior residents at the moment. And then just moving forward, thinking about kind of the third phase here, next possible steps, just really ironing out time spent at the VA versus the Moran. I think there's benefit to both, as we can see, um, but we want to be open-minded and see if there's any other changes we can make based on feedback maybe minimizing even more administrative tasks such as chief packets um, and then incorporating the intern as much as possible into the clinic at the VA and maybe having a little bit more structure in regards to teaching the intern at the VA. Thank you guys for listening. I think that's it. There we go. Our next speaker is Mubarak and he will talk about implementing a longitudinal surgical curriculum for ophthalmology residents at the University of Utah. Uh, yeah, so this is a um, really cool project I just been kind of part of with uh, the surgical committee um, and a bunch of all-stars here. Just uh, special attention to Dr. Uh, Simpson and Dr. Who are our faculty members for uh, this initiative, as well as um, our chief resident, Tony Mai, Aisha Patil, and uh, Tim Trong, who's uh, one of the fellow representatives. Um, so we all have kind of remembered, as, as far as like ophthalmology residents here at Moran, just, you know, your first time in the OR, 
first time doing cataract surgery. And certainly you've done like IC and, and you practice in the wet lab, but uh, there's nothing that can stimulate that. And, um, you know, certainly we, we know that um, a, a structured surgical curriculum is uh, vital for a residency training. It helps with uniform skill acquisition, helps residents progress through like clearly defined milestones and helps prevent gaps in training. And uh, we also know that, you know, the cerebral training here at the Moran is, um, you know, world class. Um, but, uh, you know, at present, uh, many residents are uh, kind of doing stuff on their own as far as kind of making sure they meet milestones, make sure that they're um, doing the stuff that they need to do in the wet lab just to be prepared uh, for day one in the OR. Um, there's this um, quote by Benjamin Franklin, without continual growth and progress, such words such as improvement, achievement, success have no meaning. Uh, so the goal, um, uh, as far as kind of this curriculum, and was kind of um, developed from uh, discussions among residents. I know Tony and I had discussions um, as roommates, just in terms of uh, kind of the preparedness for uh, surgery, uh, and just you know wanting to have something that was a little bit more concrete, more longitudinal, where uh, faculty would be assessing uh, milestones and having uh, practice and dedicated what lab, uh, you know, with faculty members. Uh, so the goal was to develop a longitudinal uh, surgical and wet lab curriculum incorporating clearly defined milestones where residents can be evaluated at regular intervals uh, with uh, logical development of surgical skills from PGY2 to PGY4. Uh, the curriculum was tailored uh, to each level, uh, offering instruction that aligns uh, with their specific training needs. And the overarching goal was to prepare residents for live surgery with uh, better preparation and theoretical uh, knowledge. Um, so we're pretty proud of the MOL curriculum, uh, the Marine Ophthalmology Learning Experience, which um, you know I think has been published many times um, just since it's been um, uh, made. And Dr. Vigante is here as well, who's one of the uh, foremost um, uh, head people in, in that um, initiative. But um, our goal was to try to uh, have the flipped classroom model where residents uh, studied uh, core concepts before attending lectures uh, and then had hands-on wet lab sessions afterwards with faculty members uh, so the uh, pre-work included key, uh, key literature, surgical textbooks, watching videos, uh, and then reviewing uh, clinical cases. And we came up with a name at the bequest of uh, Dr. Hu, and we're going to call ourselves the Lyme Curriculum Longitudinal Integrated Surgical Experience. Um, yeah. Uh, so the needs assessment um, was critical for identifying strengths and gaps in current uh, surgical training. So. Um, you know, we had a pretty diverse uh, surgical committee incorporating kind of all years of residency, PGY2, PGY3, PGY4, as well as a fellow, and then our two attending uh, faculty members. Uh, we wanted to send out a survey to former residents, which is planned regarding their surgical experience. Um, but the initial needs assessment was through our surgical um, uh, curriculum meeting and, and kind of surveying the uh, residents and the fellows, as well as the attendings, who um, I know that Catherine had uh, done residency here, and then Dr. Um, uh, Simpson had done her fellowship. Uh, we developed an 11-question free answer uh, survey uh, that is planned to be sent to former residents uh, in regards to kind of um, evaluating kind of the best aspects of training areas for improvement, practices from other institutions um, that they uh, have practiced at or um, are done training at, uh, and then uh, specific inquiries into wet lab utilization, surgical didactics, uh, and skills that uh, either felt underdeveloped or uh, absent after graduation. Um, and here's our needs assessment. Uh, just kind of has six additional uh, six um, topics with kind of additional questions down there. Um, so as far as the preliminary curriculum design, um, our planning commenced in uh, winter of 2023. Uh, initial needs assessment was based on the feedback of the committee. Um, and overlying themes were a regimented uh, didactic and wet lab instruction, instruction for surgical reading, uh, milestone assessment. Um, and then from this, we uh, designed a pilot um, for uh, cataract surgery curriculum that should be commencing here soon, uh, end of spring of 2024, post OCAPS and post resident research day, uh, with the goal of uh, doing a four week curriculum that is cataract focused. Um, and then as far as um, the uh, audience, we're going to be targeting rising PGY3s and rising PGY4s. With the goal of uh, the current PGY2 class, we want to have them able to progress through preoperative evaluation and in the wet lab, all steps of cataract surgery. And then for the PGY, uh, rising PGY4s, current PGY3s, uh, we want to have um, a wet lab and uh, um, kind of didactic um, uh, time uh, that allows them to just kind of progress through advanced cataract surgical techniques and complications that they'll see in the OR. Uh, here's a sample course for one week for the rising PGY3. It's a busy slide, um, but as you can see, it incorporates like specific learning objectives, uh, pre-work, didactics, as well as the hands-on 
sweat lab session. And then I just kind of uh, collated this into um, kind of the different weeks. Uh, sorry for the um, font there as far as uh, the, the new slide, but um, week one, you can see that they're planning for FACO as far as kind of preoperative evaluation. So the pre-work includes curated videos and a uh, cataract evaluation guide that was developed by um, Tony Mai. Uh, preoperative considerations is the didactic portion and then hands-on learning about kind of OR etiquette, a microscope introduction, um, as Dr. Hu had taught me how to be comfortable during surgery and make sure that, you know, the bed's at the correct height and the patient's at the correct height. Uh, week two, keep more curated videos talking about wound creation and capsorexis. You move to sculpting, grooving, and cracking, and IA in week three, and then just kind of putting it all together in a uh, wet lab session during the fourth week. Uh, similar um, in terms of kind of the four-week curriculum for rising PGY4. So uh, for them, it's going to be a little bit more advanced. So the first week kind of talking about chopping techniques in the wet lab um, and then kind of more complex anterior segment uh, procedures, myelin rings, uh, CTRs in week two, anterior vajectomy in week three. And then again, they get to all put it all together. And certainly the pre-week is a little bit different too. We'll be utilizing the score curriculum for the PGY4s. Uh, and then this is just kind of a highlight for what's coming. Um, I think Dr. Hu and Dr. Simpson had sent out a um, kind of an email as well talking about cataract day, where it's kind of the week four of our pilot uh, cataract curriculum course, a full day of instruction, where in the morning we'll have AM didactics and then um, hands-on wet lab instruction in the afternoon. Um, have many wonderful partners um, as far as um, industry sponsors, including Corza, uh, the DRV system, which um, Vision um, Engineering is sponsoring to have uh, a couple of those here, Alcon and Zeitz, who are bringing their FACO emulsification machines. Uh, so we'll have Dr. Barry Seibel, who I didn't know, like wrote the book on FACO emulsification, uh, giving us uh, instruction in the morning uh, as far as lens over uh, view selection, correcting astigmatism. Um, and then we'll have uh, a, skit lab, a skill lab wet session, uh, wet lab session rather, in the afternoon for all the residents, including the PGY threes, um, PGY four uh, rising residents. Then, as far as future directions, um, you know, certainly this is kind of a rollout of our pilot for an abbreviated curriculum. It's mostly uh, cataract and anterior segment focused. Uh, during the end of the academic year, we plan to have a formal rollout of a curriculum, hopefully in the 24, 25 academic year, which includes uh, other elements of uh, ophthalmology surgery, including strabismus and retina surgery, and then ocular plastics for uh, the PGY2s. Uh, plan to send out a formal needs assessment to current and former residents at the Moran here by soon, uh, which we'll use as uh, pre and post intervention metric data. Be really interesting to see just in terms of surgical complications and outcomes as well post um, this curriculum. Uh, we have our surgical video night with Nicole Fram just as a plug on the 16th and then the cataract day on the 21st. Um, and then you should, uh, some of the faculty have uh, received emails in regards to volunteering for our curriculum uh, in regards to the didactic portions during weeks one through three. So uh, really appreciate it if um, we could have some of the faculty join as well. Um, and again, my last um, point here is just, it's an iterative process, just super excited that we're getting this um, kind of running I'm excited to just kind of uh, find out some of this um, uh, post-intervention data we'll have soon as well. So a lot to look forward to. And um, I think I'm kind of speaking for the entire curriculum when I say we're pretty excited about it. And uh, thank you. Nana, eyes on the future. Um, optimizing learning with an ophthalmology study planner. I was overzealous there, walking early. Uh, so we will go ahead and commence here. I have no cat photos this time or no uh, uh, quotes for you. So this is the title. Uh, my project aims to help uh, uh, kind of address the stress of, of studying, especially at the start of residency. I have, again, no financial disclosure still. Um, I'm going to take you on a journey, um, show you photographs. I'm just going to take this up. I'm going to show you photographs of our interns uh, to help uh, guide you on why I was so motivated to, to partake in this study. Um, this, is an inter uh, this is a photograph of Amen that I took uh, on the fifth floor conference room. And uh, it, in many ways, describes that first feeling you get when you start residency or a new job or even like walk into a gym, uh, kind of a disaster, uh, but uh, excitement uh, towards the future. Um, and so like like Amen here, I think uh, the, the intern process or just beginning residency can be a daunting task and 
what might seem uh, like an exercise in futility. And so very, very excited about um, the future directions of what we're what I'm going to talk about soon here. If this slide is overwhelming to you, that's perfect. If it's not, uh, I think you should uh, reach out to me and maybe I can learn something from you. Uh, like Madison here, there's a bunch of resources uh, that we have to kind of juggle uh, when it comes to um, developing your plan for your foundational learning in ophthalmology. Uh, and so this is a non-exhaustive list, obviously. I'm not going to run through all the options, but uh, the point is there's so many things that you can do to, to, to start your study. And uh, the question is, where do you go? This is a picture of Chase, uh, the, the facial expression. I don't quite remember why I took this photo, but uh, uh, oh, yes, j just took his haircut. That, that's exactly right. Just cut off his his mane of a hair. Uh, and again, this this grin or grimace that he's showing, again, exemplifies that 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 difficulty in, in that beginning. Uh, and then I have a picture of Nadim uh, doing something that perhaps he doesn't feel quite qualified for. Uh, and I think developing your schedule when you don't even know the field of ophthalmology, um, your study schedule that is, is sometimes like that. Uh, you don't feel like you're qualified to do this. You don't know who to, to reach out to or how to reach out, uh, things like that. I also have some quotes here from other residents at other programs. Um, and again, this is really the, the premise of why I think this is so important. I'm just going to read some of these out loud. I'm so tired from how, I, how hard I work. When am I supposed to study? I need all the help I can get. I didn't know how to consistently study throughout the year. I did 1,500 questions, but most of that was early on when I was motivated. I feel like that last part is actually a really, really, uh, I don't know, at least hits home for me. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know about you guys. And so there are challenges. Uh, what are they? Um, of course, we have irregular schedules with our call, and uh, if you're an intern, you're sometimes on these different rotations that have entirely drastically different uh, uh, study schedules. There's an increasing foundational learning requirement. Every year there's more information. I don't know if they actually remove information that you need to learn when it comes to understanding the field of ophthalmology, especially if you want to master it. Uh, there, there's, of course, a lack of structured study plan. Of course, we have our lectures, we have our wet labs, we have things that are integrated into our schedule. But when you go home, it really is up to you to devise uh, your game plan on how you want to move forward. Uh, there's knowledge gaps that will exist. And of course, all of this adds to stress, um, which is uh, kind of a, a, a bigger topic, especially this year in ophthalmology and specifically in residency. But uh, I think it's just been uh, simmering throughout. And so my project proposal, and I've been working with uh, Dr. Pagunta and, and, and several medical students with, uh, is to develop an Excel-based study planner. Uh, and the key features are that it's customizable. And actually, most importantly, that it's um, automated. Uh, so it tells you exactly what you need to do without uh, you having to worry too much about uh, uh, making that plan for you. Uh, and some of the features with this study planner are, first off, the input uh, preferences. So you can say how many hours you want to work on a day off, on a post-call shift, on a uh, day on, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You can pick the topics of interest or perhaps the order of interest you want to study things in. Uh, when we get to the point of adding multiple materials, you can synchronize the materials across uh, your study plan. The output uh, just refers to um, what you plan on studying. So uh, it'll show you exactly what uh, you should be studying that specific day, how many hours, how many questions, how many minutes, things like that. Uh, and then actually my favorite aspect and, and, and the hardest one to implement is the automated rebalancing. Uh, so the purpose of that is obviously you're not going to necessarily work every single day. You're not going to be motivated to study every single day. Uh, maybe you're on call, didn't get sleep. Uh, you're going to go home and the, probably the last thing on your mind is, is opening up the BCSC. Uh, maybe it was the last thing on your mind to begin with, but uh, uh, <laughs> it's nice when uh, the, the, the study planner can actually help you rebalance when you miss a day, a uh, wedding, a tragic thing in, in the family. That's kind of the overall goal uh, for this. And that specific point is, is what helps address the stress of studying, at least for me, uh, when I look at things. In fact, and this is not something I plan to talk about, but I actually think a lot of it, a lot of this is similar to like working out. Uh, I think the task of walking into a gym and just going to the gym and planning on working out is a daunting one. Uh, there's a bunch of people, there's a bunch of different resources you can utilize, uh, but it's a lot easier when you have a plan already in place. Um, and it's specifically a lot easier to stay consistent with that plan when you've planned it, I guess. And so I have a couple of slides to show you kind of pictures of the beginning phases of what this would look like. Uh, so this is 
part of the input uh, aspect of the Excel uh, planner. Uh, in the green highlighted, oh, this can't really see colors up there, but on the, ooh, that's actually really bad. <laughs> so you can see on the bottom left, it says how much to study, uh, study OCAP present slides and do questions. Those are all things that you can customize. Uh, it's probably really, really small, but uh, there's a column that says shift type. So I'll, I'll tell you if you're off, post-call, pre-call, et cetera, et cetera. Again, you can essentially edit how many hours you want to study and go from there. On the very top left, you can input your exact test date. You can say when you want to start studying, and then it'll uh, automatically customize uh, uh, the days with which uh, uh, you want to study and how it looks long term towards the right. And I just uh, gave you a quick snip snippet of what that would look like. The next picture here is kind of the output slide. So it on the top would show you the exact day. Uh, uh, the current day. Uh, and then you can also, again, see the test date. Uh, it'll tell you exactly what numbers of slides or number of questions. Um, and then on the bottom uh, left side, it'll tell you the specific presentation or PowerPoint slide you want to look at. Um, and then number of slides that um, uh, are in that, that specific PowerPoint slide. Going on to methodology, uh, so how will we effectively analyze whether or not this is actually beneficial or not, or just a complete waste of our time? Uh, uh, we'll use surveys. So we'll have a pre-implementation survey uh, that will essentially assess current study habits, current study resources, uh, your confidence level with these um, methods of study, uh, and, and, and your stress levels overall. And I just listed some sample questions that we can always talk about later. Uh, and then afterwards, after we roll out the um, uh, resource, uh, we plan on giving you a video tutorial on exactly how to use it to make it as easy as possible because we all know Excel doesn't necessarily grant that um, in abundance. Uh, we're going to start with a kind of a beta trial with uh, three institutions, of course, Moran, but also uh, UTMB and Montefiore. Uh, and then we'll evaluate the effectiveness of this with post-implementation surveys, once again, assessing satisfaction, uh, effectiveness, and uh, study habits, uh, how they have changed, and uh, most importantly, how stress levels have changed after this implementation. And then um, uh, the plan is to have some type of follow-up, whether it's quarterly, um, annually, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, using uh, people far smarter than me, uh, analyze the data um, between the pre and post implement implementation surveys. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then right now, of course, we don't have results. Uh, still, um, essentially implementing um, the Excel plan. Uh, but the hypothesis is that with in increased adherence to a study schedule, uh, you can enhance your study confidence or, or confidence in your study habits, and of course, decrease your overall stress when when it comes to all of this. So our future directions include scaling up. Uh, so that's um, essentially uh, increasing the number of resources that are in the study planner. Right now, it's just the uh, OCAP study PowerPoints, which a lot of residents currently use as their kind of primary um, foundational learning. Uh, and then uh, implementing artificial intelligence to help assist in upscaling and syncing um, uh, uh, the study resources. And then also incorporating other things that we know we need to pay attention to. So surgical skills like the wet lab, um, uh, clinical uh, training, et cetera, et cetera. And then like we've, we've heard before, iterative improvement is of utmost importance. So there'll be constant user feedback. And I, I was going to talk to you about the, I went too fast. I was going to talk to you about the motivation for this study, but I think I've already probably ran over time. So I'm actually going to keep going. Uh, there's essentially a resource that medical students use uh, called Cram Fighter that's, uh, um, kind of the, the thing I'm trying to base this off of as close as possible. And going. Okay, so conclusions. Uh, our key goal is to address stress, uh, and predominantly the stress of studying. Uh, it sounds simple, uh, but uh, it's truly something that uh, I feel like if you can at least address the planning aspect, you can really uh, keep people to be more coherent or adherent to this um, post-study plan. And a future impact, uh, again, well-being is the utmost importance uh, for this uh, specific project and as a whole. And I just want to uh, acknowledge a lot of people who've been integral in this process. Uh, so we have some medical students at UTMB, Clement Enozi and Hannah Yu, uh, Ivan Cardenas, who's going to join us next year here in Utah, and then Dr. Jardine Simpson and Dr. Vigunta in the back there. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>